The year was 2006, and somewhere in Mexico's Sinaloa Mountains, the drug boss Joaquin El Chapo Guzman had been delivered a gift two rival Los Zetas cartel members. With a stick in his hands, El Chapo beat these men so badly he fractured many of their bones. As one witness later put it, the men were so broken they looked like rag dolls. The men were then slung over ATVs and taken to a raging bonfire, where El Chapo pulled out his gun, made some derogatory comments about the guys' moms before shooting them, and then ordered their bodies to be burned. He said to one of his workers, I don't want any bones to remain. That was El Chapo to a T heartless, relentless, and ruthless protector of his monopoly. Roughly 30 years prior, in the 1980s, the mother of one of Pablo Escobar's friends was riding a bus in Colombia. The driver didn't see that the woman hadn't quite fully stepped off the bus when he drove off, leading to her falling and dying. The King of Coke was upset by what had happened and ordered one of his hitmen, Jairo Velasquez aka Popeye, to kill the bus driver. Speaking about the incident later, Popeye said, I found the driver and killed him. I didn't feel anything. We're guessing the man who ordered the hit didn't feel any remorse either. So there you go, just two examples of how these famous drug kingpins were quite similar. They both ran zero tolerance campaigns when it came to anyone that bothered them. And they were cruel and unusual people. And while they shared a lot of similarities, you will also see that they were quite different. Let's start with Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera. That's a bit of a mouthful, so we'll stick with his nickname El Chapo. That translates as Shorty. El Chapo was born on April 4, 1957 in a rival part of Mexico in the state of Sinaloa. He was poor, dirt poor, and there were many mouths to feed in his large family. His father made his income as a cattle rancher, but it wasn't the most lucrative business to be in, so El Chapo used to sell oranges to get some extra cash. He dropped out of school at a young age and began working with his father full time. At 15, he started another side business, this time with marijuana instead of oranges, as a means to help out with family finances. And by age 20, he was already working with Mexican cartels. It's what you might call a rags to riches story. Working in the fields, earning $2 a day wasn't for El Chapo. The illegal substances industry was way more lucrative. Escobar has some surprising similarities in his early life. Born Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria on December 1, 1949, he grew up in a small town called Rio Negro, which is about 45 minutes from Medellin in Colombia. His mother, Emilda, was a school teacher and his father, Abel, was a cattle farmer just like El Chapo's. Though Escobar's early life wasn't quite as humble as El Chapo's, he was also part of a big family and was one of seven kids, though his family didn't struggle as much financially. But young Pablo was always around narcotics, specifically marijuana and cocaine, and it didn't take him long to realize the financial opportunity they represented, especially when it was sold to Americans who were quickly embracing cocaine with a passion. Back to El Chapo and his rise to power. First, he worked for a cartel when a number of Mexican drug cartels were part of an alliance formed by one Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, aka El Padrino. The Godfather really got things organized and moved enough coke into the US to keep Wall Street bankers partying for the next millennia. Guzman became a major player in the Sinaloa cartel under one Hector El Guero Palma. Palma liked El Chapo, he was trustworthy and he also wasn't scared to use violence. Cross him or mess up his shipment and bang bang, that was it. When the Godfather was eventually arrested, a power vacuum was created in the Mexican drug trade. Various cartels, including the Sinaloa cartel, wanted the best routes to get their Colombian coke into the booming US market. Even the DEA knows that when you take out a boss, all that happens is lots and lots of violence and basically no interruption of the flow of drugs. So with the Godfather put away, what naturally happened is bodies started piling up. The violence was incredibly brutal. People were getting sawn in half with chainsaws, heads literally rolled in the streets. In 1995, when El Chapo's associate was arrested, he was finally able to take control of the Sinaloa cartel. He was just 38 years old. It was a meteoric rise from the cattle farmer to drug lord. Soon, his cartel would become the most powerful in all of Mexico. He had cops in his front pocket, local politicians in the back, and he even managed to bribe his way out of prison. Escobar, on the other hand, was involved in all sorts of petty crimes as a child, but it was in his early 20s that he got into more serious violent crime and kidnapping while working with a local mobster. He had a reputation for being a very violent and unpredictable young man. He made a bigger name for himself when he kidnapped a local businessman who had recently laid off many poor workers. His family paid the ransom, but Pablo and his gang killed the man anyway. Pablo soon had his eyes set on bigger profits and in Colombia that meant one thing, cocaine. He knew you could buy stacks of coca leaves for pennies, turn them into paste, 
and sell the product to US dealers who were seeing a huge demand for the drug. It was the 1970s, the time of the hippies had ended, and Americans were turning towards disco music. LSD and Mary Jane said their goodbyes and Mr. Cocaine made his entrance to the party. There were no drug cartels back then and Escobar realized in his early 20s that he could make a fortune and make it fast. Cocaine was like the Louis Vuitton of drugs. You could take a cheap product and sell it for outrageous prices. At 26, Escobar had already banked $3 million, which today would be about $15 million. And unlike El Chapo, he did it without having to chop off any heads. He could have bought a big house with a swimming pool and retired, but of course, for these guys it's never enough. In the late 90s, El Chapo was also moving methamphetamine into the US. He could produce the stuff without much hassle from the authorities, and it proved to be very popular with Americans who liked to do a lot of house cleaning or play video games for three days straight without sleeping. It was also very cheap compared to coke. Another benefit for the cartel was the fact that he didn't have to buy it from the Colombians. He could have his people make it in meth labs and move it straight into the US. He soon became the boss of bosses and had control of the cartels in many states in Mexico. He became the new godfather and wielded great power. He was arrested and imprisoned but broke out of prison in 2001. That breakout apparently cost him two and a half million bucks, or virtually nothing, to Mexico's new boss of bosses. But soon the peace pact that the cartels had made was broken and before you could say chainsaw, thousands upon thousands of people were caught up in the violence that followed and killed. This included civilians, women and children as well as those directly involved with the cartels. El Chapo somehow stayed on top and it's thought he was protected at least in part by the DEA since he gave up a lot of other cartel members. He was wanted in the US but because he helped the DEA that indictment was dropped for a time. The violence didn't stop and what happened was one of the bloodiest and most vile turf wars the world has ever seen, with people killed in the most horrific ways. Men were tortured, cut to pieces, beheaded, and in one especially gruesome case, a man's face was stitched onto a soccer ball and sent back to his cartel. As for Escobar, his people were also extreme, and it's thought his gang killed as many as 4,000 people during their cocaine dealing days. They took out leading politicians, lawyers, and even blew up an airplane carrying a presidential candidate, killing 107 people. Escobar's power was greater than anything El Chapo would ever have. He really was the king of coke, whereas El Chapo was more like a very big flash in the pan. Escobar created the business of trafficking cocaine, while the Mexican gangs were merely buying their cocaine or being paid to move it for them. Escobar was also seen as a kind of Robin Hood figure, since he gave a significant amount of cash to poor communities and built up infrastructure like schools and hospitals. While the murder rate in Medellin was out of control, Escobar was out of El Chapo in the Mexican cartel's league when it came to killing. Sure, he blew up buildings and made Medellin the murder capital of the world. He killed lawyers and took out around 600 cops, but his level of violence was not close to what would later happen in Mexico. He had so much control he simply didn't have the need to fight off a large number of competing cartels. He was also a master at public relations, and he ran things more like a business than an unruly bloodthirsty mob. It was simple with him. You take the money, or you take the bullet. The deal he gave to officials was an offer they couldn't refuse, plato o plomo, silver or lead, and it was a very real offer. And the Colombian authorities had every right to be fearful of this powerful man. He could bribe or take out anyone no matter how high they were in their particular office. At one point Escobar was getting around 15 tons of cocaine into the US every single day. This worked out to something like $26 billion a year for the cartel. Forbes even put Escobar down as one of the richest men in the world with a net worth of $30 billion. He truly was the king. El Chapo may have been successful, but he was never the king. Or if he was, his kingdom paled in comparison to Escobar's. Escobar was killed in 1993 at 44 years old. At the time of his death, he had more money stashed away than you can imagine. He owned properties all over the world. 25,000 Colombians mourned for their real-life Robin Hood at his funeral. But did the drugs stop moving after Escobar's death? Of course not. They just started getting trafficked by different people, namely the Cali cartel. This cartel also had power in politics and could easily buy off certain law enforcement agencies. One thing that did change is the crime rate and murder rate in Medellin did go down by a lot, but mostly because cocaine now comes out of other South American countries. The stuff is cheap and easy to grow, although the farmers don't make much from it. And that's one reason why the traffickers don't mind getting their shipments stopped. It doesn't cost much to buy from the producers, so if you lose a shipment, it's no big deal. It's as simple as that. 
The risks are great, since you might get killed or tortured or imprisoned, but the profits are too good not to do business. El Chapo wasn't killed like Escobar, but was arrested for the last time in 2014 when he was 56 years old. How much cash he had is up for debate. The US has been looking for his money for years and has come up with next to nothing. Meanwhile, reports suggest it cost the US taxpayer billions of dollars to capture this cartel leader who was simply replaced in a heartbeat. The Sinaloa cartel is still as big as it ever was, with its biggest competitor arguably being the Jalisco New Generation. The DEA is now spending more billions trying to capture the leaders of those gangs, who will only be replaced by a never-ending queue of men ready to take their place. Cocaine use in the US and in many parts of Europe, especially the UK, is on the rise as we speak so it's likely these men will just continue to get more and more powerful. Since El Chapo's arrest and the power vacuum opened in its wake, Mexico's murder rate had steadily increased and hit an all-time high in 2019. A report released by the Secretariat of Public Security stated that there were over 34,582 murders in Mexico that year, and in March 2020, the highest number ever of homicides was reported, 2,585. Why compare these two world-famous drug lords? Well, one reason is so that you can see that the war on drugs will never end and can't be won. And another reason is to show you that El Chapo was just one guy in the game. He was replaced, and some other guy will probably get some media attention soon. He'll become the number one outlaw and scapegoat for something that's much bigger than him. As for Escobar, well, sure, he's been replaced, but let's remember one thing. He started the game. He was no flash in the pan. He was the very fire that ignited decades of cocaine use and abuse in the USA and across the world. Now go watch this, Hotel Escobar, the luxury prison Pablo Escobar built for himself. Or try this video, how insane is El Chapo's prison cell security?